Hi everyone, my name is Dina and I will be giving you a talk that is titled Have You Tried Deno Yet? This is the logo of Deno, it's a cute little dinosaur. So Deno might sound familiar and this is because it is essentially very similar to Node and it was made by the same person who made Node, his name is Ryan Dahl and Deno is in a way an alternative to Node and Deno is advertised on its website as a secure runtime for JavaScript and TypeScript. Note the difference in how Node.js is advertised. It is not advertised as secure, and it doesn't say TypeScript. A little bit more background about Deno. You may not have heard of it because it's quite obscure still. It was first announced as a prototype by Ryan Dahl, the creator of Node, in 2018, so nearly 10 years after Node was originally created. And in this talk called 10 Things I Regret About Node.js, Ryan Dahl spends a good 10 minutes or so complaining about what kind of design decisions he hates about what he made about Node when making it. And then he says, well, this talk seems really negative. So I thought, could I offer something better? Could I offer something that's a little bit uh, fixed all those problems? So Ryan Dahl's 10 regrets about Node.js are actually only about six. At least he doesn't specify any more in the video directly. Number one, his regret is not sticking with promises. He introduced promises for a brief moment, but then removed them, worrying that they might be the wrong abstraction. Number two, he regrets the security aspect of Node. And we'll see a little bit more about this when I do a demo. Three, the build system chip. He says it's horrible. I wouldn't know. And then he regrets package, package JSON, Node modules, and index.js. So... Uh, that was a really quick overview of what is Deno. Now I'm going to show you a little demo about what it looks like. What is it? What can you do with it? How does it differ to Node? And I'm going to show a demo about simply parsing stuff. So if you've never used Deno before, the first step is just to go to deno.land and then you can press the install button here. You've got a couple of options on how to install Deno. You don't need to use like an NVM or anything, you could just do this, and then, or you can use Brew to install Deno. I've already got Deno installed, so I'm not going to do this step. What I'm going to do is there's this text file in my public S3 bucket, which I want to parse, and I can show you what this text file contains. Basically, it's a list of students who have taken an exam, and each student has scored something in the exam, and I would like to now quickly write a script where I calculate the average score, of, like the, the total average of scores from this list of students who took tests. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this example data as a text file onto my downloads folder. Then I'm just gonna open up my VS Code editor from my downloads folder. And then I'm just gonna, <laughs> what's great about this is I don't have to do any npm init or anything like that. So I'm just going to start by creating a file called parsestuff.ts. Now, as you can see, TypeScript just uh, got it globally installed. It comes, Deno will be able to parse it directly. I don't have to write any TypeScript versions into any kind of package.json. So I'm just going to straight start coding. So I'm going to say const get content equals and then I'm going to say deno dot, oh wait, it doesn't recognize deno. What is this? Ah, I know. I haven't initialized my workspace yet. I'm going to enable deno linting. I'm not going to enable the unstable APIs. And now I have autocomplete. So I'm going to say read text file. And then I'm going to pass it my local example underscore data dot txt. Now, this deno initializing workspace came from the deno plugin. So if you're going to start using it, install the plugin for VS Code, and there we go. Then I want to calculate the average score. So I'm going to say calculate average score. And I'm going to pass this a get content function, which matches the signature of this, which is a promise string. And then I'm just going to say get the content, then and I'm going to start parsing. And now we're going to write just a quick bit of boilerplate code. And then I'll show you the features of Deno while I'm writing the boilerplate code. So first, we want to parse the lines. So we're going to say the lines are result 
split with R. And then we're going to map each line. And we're going to, because if we remember the data, it's separated by commas. So we're going to say each line, we're going to split it with commas. And now, because we're programmers, we probably messed this up already. So we want to test what did that actually do. So we we'll say console log lines. Now is when we start using deno. So what I'm going to write in my terminal, remember I'm in my downloads folder, I'm going to say deno run parse stuff.ts. And I forgot to actually call my function. And here we see one interesting thing. Brian Dahl was complaining in his talk about the security of Node. So when he designed Deno, he wanted to specifically make uh, permissions that you grant Deno very, very explicit. So what this error is complaining about is that the allow read flag hasn't been set. That means that Deno by default doesn't have access to read files in your local file system. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say deno run allow read parse stuff dot ts. And as we can see, it's pretty much parse it like we wanted. Perfect. But we're not done. And specifically, I forgot to remove the very first thing because this is not a number. So I'm just going to quickly say filter. And I'm going to say filter out the very first index. So where index isn't. Zero. Great. And now we're going to get the scores as a list of numbers. So we're going to say lines map, and it's the third, uh, it's the element with index three for each is raised. And we're just going to pass it into a number. So then we can like console log the scores. Hopefully, that should be. Okay, great. So we've got the scores. So now we're just going to return the average score because that's the point of our function. So we're going to say return scores reduce um, cumulative current and then we're going to say scores. I heard a funny noise, so I'm just going to check that my connection is still valid and you guys are here. Perfect. Let me know if you can't hear me or anything. Okay, so now calculate average score should return the average score, and we're just going to say console log average score, and we're going to and because this actually returns a promise, we're going to say await. Okay, okay so run, and the average score is six point seven five five, which we expected. So what we can see already here is we basically we just want to write the script with TypeScript. And we did not have to init anything. We didn't have to make an elaborate folder structure that contained known modules. We didn't have to ask anything from NPM. We just put a TypeScript file in our downloads folder and started scripting. And then we're just able to run it from the terminal. So what I really love about Deno is the fact that you can just do this. You can use it for your quick and dirty scripting and you can you know, do IO and you can just like do whatever you want. So let's take this demo a little bit further. Now, maybe I don't want to get my content from the local file system. Maybe I want to get my content from the internet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get it straight from here, from my S3 bucket. And I'm just going to say, get content from internet, fetch stuff, then c.text. And this should this should be completely interchangeable with this one. So let's try it. Get content from internet. Does it return the same score? Oh, wait a second. Uncaught permission denied. Network access to public stuff isn't allowed. Run again with the allow net flag. Right, so this again showcases how Deno specifically requires you to specify what you allow it to do and what you don't allow it to do. So we're going to try that again. Deno run, and this time we're going to give it the allow net flag, and we're going to say parse stuff.ts. Perfect. We got the same result as we did before. And this time we didn't need to use the allow read flag because we didn't need to, we weren't using this function anymore because we replaced it with this function. Ta -da. So that's really good. And now what I might want to do here is I might just run and write a test for this. And recently I was like, frustrated in a, in a some like, you know, normal JavaScript. Uh, project. It was like a tiny little project, but it didn't have Jest installed already. And I just wanted to make a little feature change. 
and I wanted to write a test, but I, could, I was so frustrated because I couldn't write a quick test because the testing library hadn't been installed and I wasn't sure whether it was worth the effort to install a testing library or not. But the great thing about Denil is you don't actually have to install any testing library. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just actually make a module here. I'm gonna call it calculate. I'm gonna paste in my uh, function here. I'm gonna say export this function and then I'm gonna write a test file for my uh, my little module there. And then I'm going to, like a proper programmer, I'm gonna go on the internet and I'm gonna copy paste what it says on the internet about the syntax of how you write tests. So deno.lan slash manual slash test. And then I'm gonna paste it here. So this is the first time that we see an import. Now, what's very similar to Denode and all the JavaScript stuff you know is that importing works pretty much the same. But what is slightly different is that this is a URL. So Deno gets its modules from, uh, it resolves modules by a URL. It's a universal resource locator or whatever else stands for, I can't remember, universal resource in, in something. So uh, the nice thing about this is as well, it's the first time you would run this file Deno will cache what's in here onto your computer. So it doesn't have to make a network request every time it tries to get you a library, just once. And then you can force it to get it again with the reload flag. Uh, so I'm gonna write uh, a test for my calculate function. So first I'm gonna have to provide it with a mock version of our Git content. So I'm just gonna write that really quickly. And let's take some example data here. So it's gonna go into our calculate.test.ts file. And then I'm going to just, I'm gonna make my test data so that it's exactly like my parser, so that my parser can parse it. And that should be good. And then I'm gonna fetch the scores so that I can expect a specific result when I write my test which right now. So this guy scored one, this guy scored two, and this guy scored three. So that means that we're expecting the average score to be two. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say assert equals, and then I'm gonna say assert equals calculate average score, which I need to import locally. And then I'm gonna say get. And I must expect it to be two. So what you can notice here is that calculate average score is imported locally, but locally we specify that it's a .ps file. Now we may not be so used to this type of extra specification, but it's specifically designed this way because it's unnecessarily unspecific to not include the file extension. One thing I have remembered when practicing this is that this won't work unless I do it this way. So the score is needs to be awaited. And then this needs to be a sync. And then let's try this. So I'm gonna say deno test test.ts. And my test passed, so the average score is two. I'm just gonna show you that you believe me that it wasn't just an error in my code. Uh, yeah, it fails if you put some random number, so it's put two and our test succeeds. Writing tests is really easy because you don't have to install any kind of extra framework. You just write tests for your little scripts to make sure that your little scripts work. So let's take this one step further. Now, maybe we don't want to include uh, the calculate.ts in the same repo as parse stuff. Maybe we actually want to ship calculate.ts as a, as a module of its own. So what I'm gonna do is in my little S3 bucket here, I'm going to just upload my file calculate.ts. It succeeded. So in my public stuff for demo purposes. I now have a TypeScript file and I can just copy its, uh, yeah, basically I'll copy the link like this. And then I will in my parse stuff, I don't need this anymore. Instead, I don't need this anymore. 
I'm going to import calculate average score from data. And then I'm going to say, uh, let's try it. And it returned our average score as expected. So we didn't need to put our calculate.ts into any centralized um, NPM, you know, internet repository. It was just there. We, we made our own little module. We put it somewhere where you can access it from the internet and we imported it really simply. And look at my folder structure. There's nothing extra here. It's just TypeScript files. It's just .test.ts files and it just works. So that was a brief demo of Deno and how you can use it to do ad hoc scripting. One of the reasons why I'm giving this talk is because Deno is a technology that many people might be interested in but haven't yet tried. So I want to just show you, this is what it looks like in simplicity. This is a bar chart from one of our uh, futurists competitors in Finland, Nitor, who recently published a article about what developers have been using in the backend and uh, what they want to be using in the future. So Node.js is very used and liked, or people are at least neutral about it. Deno, not so used yet, but many people are showing interest in it. So I hope you had some interest in it as well. So Deno version 1.0.0 came out in May, 2020. And then I basically joined a team in a startup in June, 2020 one month after version 1.0.0 came out and uh, we needed a backend stack and uh, I said, let's use Deno. So we ended up using Deno <laughs> and it had just, V1 had just come out. So um, it has some interesting issues, uh, which I might talk a little bit about more. So this slide was just here to emphasize that one of the reasons, like one of the main design ideas behind Deno is really problems aren't so much around the IO with Node, the problems are to do with the module system and how user code is managed. So when I first started doing modern JavaScript stuff in like 2018, I'd previously done, you know, just JavaScript in the browser, jQuery and stuff. I was so confused when I did my first uh, NPM in it. I was like, what are all these files? Which ones are magic? Which ones can you uh, customize? I didn't understand, like, what, what is this package.json package lock file? And uh, th this is really what Deno removes from the equation. It's like, uh, you, you don't need that stuff. Why did you ever need it? The one thing that Deno doesn't yet deliver fully is the same ecosystem as, as Node has. So if you're thinking about should you use Deno or Node, you might first want to just check that, yeah, you have your like all the, all the uh, extensions you need. Like this doesn't seem to really have Sentry. Maybe you want something like Azure. So Deno has like its own, these are kind of like NPM, but they're not NPM because Deno isn't about being compatible with NPM. So you cannot use your NPM modules directly in Deno, but the community have written lots of plugins for Deno. So basically there are options, but the ecosystem is not as big as the you know, NPM ecosystem. So you are probably wondering, should you use Deno? And I would say, yes, definitely for your personal projects and for your small little things, you can make a nice little server with it. You can, you can use, you know, you can, you can just write HTTP stuff with it, and then you can just ship it in a Docker container, put it in your favorite uh, cloud provider in a container, and then it will run. And if you don't need many integrations and you're not afraid to fix things when they break in the ecosystem, then you will probably be fine but you shouldn't just jump straight to using Deno to replace your old node system. Like say you have a client and the client says, we have this old node backend thing. We need to just make a replacement that has exactly the same features as the old one. Deno might not be suitable for that because it doesn't necessarily have perfect integration with all of the third party libraries that you'd want it to. Uh, sometimes you might need a very specific NPM package, which just doesn't exist for Deno. Like, for example, I was on a client project where we needed to use a very specific location tracking NPM package that was very highly specialized and customizable. Sorry, not customizable, highly specialized. And we couldn't use anything. We, we obviously had to get it from NPM. So if it takes too much effort to convince your stakeholders, be they your client or your fellow developers, then honestly, Node is just 
fine. You don't need to use Deno just because it is shiny and beautiful and perfect. You can also just use Node. The nice thing about Node is it's, uh, it's very, Deno is very similar to Node. They both run JavaScript, TypeScript. It's, uh, you know, they, they've got the core language parts and really the, the whole um, module system, packages system, it's not like thoroughly incompatible. You could take your favorite NPM module and you could take the JavaScript and TypeScript out of it and put it in, package it so that it's compatible with Deno and then you can use it in your Deno project. But that step takes effort. So yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this talk. I may have forgotten to mention some things which were relevant and important. If so, please ask. And even if you have a not so relevant or important question, please also ask. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Minna. I already installed Deno during the talk, so I got convinced. We can have one question in, in the stream, and then we can have the rest in, in the Slack. Does anyone have anything in mind? If not, I can ask a question, because the, the first thing that kind of came to my mind with the way that it uses third-party packages is that how to keep kind of how to keep the different versions in check, like updating packages if they yeah. are like versioned in the, the URL or the kind of the like if they're not versioned, then you know, you keep getting like the new ones. And apparently I'm... All right, I'll answer your question. So basically what you want to do is instead of doing import from this URL, which the URL contains the version, you want to make a file called deps.ts and then you want to put all your dependencies there and then you want to import them from deps.ts. So that, that is the standard way. And actually this has caused me issues in the past. Sometimes if you have uh, different versions of, of, of stuff, uh, actually Deno, Deno might just break silently and, and die. So uh, <laughs> watch out for that and put your dependencies into deps.ts, nicely sorted. Awesome. I had the same question as you, Yuhis, but kind of continuing off of that, how would you run Deno in production now that you have the deps.ts if you kind of don't download all of your Deno modules into a NPM modules kind of folder? I, I don't know if I answer the question, but when you run it in your production, you just have to allow net, and then when it starts up, it fetches them. Does that answer the question? Probably not. Please specify. Sort of. So you're, you're, you're kind of uh, hoping that everything works in the distribution end. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.